Hey everybody, my name is John W. Adi, and if you don't know who I am, I'm the author of Fail State, which was published earlier this year by March Lord Press. Fail State is the story of a teenage superhero competing for a government vigilante license on reality TV. You should definitely go check it out if you haven't already, but not, not yet, not yet. Right now, we're going to talk about video games. That may seem like an odd topic at a writer's conference, but it's really not that unusual for me. See, I love video games, probably a bit more than I should. As a matter of fact, I suspect that if I didn't play video games, I'd probably get a lot more writing done. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed about video games in recent years is that the designers are getting more and more serious about telling in-depth stories within their games. While there still is a lot of shoot 'em up big explosions, some games are trying to engage some, some serious storytelling. And because of that, I think there's an intersection between video games and writing novels. While we can teach them some stuff about building a good story, I think they can teach us some stuff about building a good story, too. And we're going to look at one of those intersections today, namely what video games can teach us about backstory, or, more specifically, what cutscenes can teach us about backstory. Here's an example of a cutscene from a game called Endless Space. It happens right at the beginning of a game. It basically tells us who we are as players, what kind of goals we have, that sort of a thing. And that's really what cutscenes do. They, it's a break in the action so that the story can be moved forward, so data can be shared with the player, so missions can be given, something like that. But the important thing to notice is, is that a cutscene basically stops the game cold. The player is no longer in control, he's just a spectator. And that's part of the reason why a lot of gamers hate cutscenes. It causes the game to screech to a halt and forces them to just watch instead of participate, which is what they're supposed to be doing in a video game. Uh, because of this hatred, most video game designers include a way for players to skip a cutscene. For example, in the games that I play on my PC, the way to usually do that is to hit the escape key. Here's an example from the game StarCraft II. And in other news today, Emperor Arcturus Manx held a press conference commemorating the end of the so-called Brood War some four years ago. Our own Kate Lockwell was on the scene. Emperor, the threat of a new Zerg invasion is still very real. But instead of expanding our fleets, you've squandered trillions on hunting down has-been rebels like Jim Raynor. Jim Raynor represents a clear and present threat to this dominion. He is an unscrupulous, lawless revolutionary bent on spreading fear and dissension across the sector. He and his ragtag band of miscreants have instigated a... You see how fast that cutscene ended. That's by design. A game developer knows that if they really want to upset their customers, a surefire way of doing that is to include unskippable cutscenes. So that got me to wondering, are there cutscenes in our novels? Is there something that would create our readers to want to hit their escape keys if they could? And the more that I thought about it, I realized that the novel writing equivalent is backstory, especially if that backstory isn't handled right. Now, we all know how important backstory is to our novels. We need backstory. It's important for us to sit down and figure out every little detail about our characters, their physical description, their personal histories, their hopes and dreams and aspirations, their hobbies and their quirks, all of that. If we're creating a fictional setting, for our story. We have to figure out the town's history, who lives there, what's the layout of the land. If you write speculative fiction like I do, then you have to come up with the history for your kingdom or your empire. A good example of elaborate backstory is J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien didn't just plop Frodo and company into a vacuum, he took a lot of time to come up with legends and histories and geographies and theology for Middle-earth, most of which he compiled into a book called the Sil... the Sil... a book that I've actually never read. 
Uh, the point is, Tolkien put a lot of work into the backstory of that epic adventure, and that's the kind of detail that we should strive to come up with for our novels, too. The problem comes in how we actually include the backstory we've come up with. The way I see it, there are three basic ways that we can share the backstory we've come up with in our novels. And some of those ways are good, and some of those ways are not so good. And in discussing those ways, I'm going to illustrate what I'm talking about using cutscenes from various video games. Let's start with the way that's not so good, and that's what's called the info dump. And when I think of info dump, I think of Batman Arkham Asylum. In Batman Arkham Asylum, the player plays as Batman, which makes this game simply awesome. But the first time I played Arkham Asylum, I got so frustrated with the game that I almost quit. And the reason why is because of the beginning. It's nothing but one gigantic cutscene. Let me show you what I mean. The game starts with a typical cutscene. Batman has caught the Joker and is driving him back to Arkham Asylum. Now, you'll pardon me, I'm going to speed things up here. Just keep an eye on the counter at the bottom. Upon arrival at the asylum, Batman turns the Joker over to the warden and then follows Joker in into the asylum because he wants to see Commissioner Gordon. Now at this point, the player is supposedly in control, but all the player can do is walk forward. That's it. You can only walk as you follow the Joker through the entrance of Arkham Asylum and watch as he's checked in. Just just go ahead and watch. <laughs> Finally, 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 you reach your destination, and it's another cutscene. If you've been paying attention to the timer on the bottom of the screen, this whole sequence lasts for 10 minutes, and there's absolutely no way for the player to skip it. Now, don't get me wrong, there's important information being shared in this sequence. For example, the player learns that there was a fire at Blackgate Prison, which helps explain why so many of the Joker's goons are in Arkham Asylum to begin with. You get a glimpse of Killer Croc, an enemy that Batman will have to fight in the sewers underneath the asylum later on in the game. And, not only that, there's also the scene where Joker drops some hints that everything is not what it seems and that he's really the one in control in the asylum. It's good stuff, but it takes so long to get through. It was actually worse the first time that I played it. The first time I played Batman Arkham Asylum, I was playing it on a computer that had a motherboard that was slowly melting down. Now, I didn't know about that, but the result of that slowly melting down motherboard was that the cutscene took almost twice as long to play through. And as I was going through it, it was just dragging and dragging and dragging. And then when I finally got to the point where I was in control and I could finally do something other than walk forward, the game crashed. And I realized that I would have to start all over again from the very beginning. And I got to tell you, I was so mad. I did not want to have to sit through that cutscene again. I was so mad that I almost didn't play the game. 
Now, I'm glad that I gave it another chance. I'm glad that I got through that cutscene again because Batman Arkham Asylum is a fantastic game. I thoroughly enjoyed it. But that initial cutscene was too much. It brought the game to a screeching halt before it could even begin. And that's really why we should avoid info dumps in our novels, large sections where we just tell the readers parts of our backstory. Now, we often see this happen in the work of beginning novelists. When the time comes to share details from the backstory, they just basically regurgitate it into the text. They just dump it in, large swaths of it, resulting in ginormous walls of text that hurt the eyes. The problem with large info dumps is that they're telling, not showing. They slow the story down, and if they're long enough, they stop it entirely. And that's the last thing you want to have happen, especially if those info dumps happen at the beginning of your novel. For example, I recently read a novel where the entire first chapter was nothing but one of the main characters sitting and reminiscing about his personal history, his family's history where they came from, how they got together, how they got to be where they were while he was driving around. It kept the story from actually getting started. Now, I understand why the author included that. It's certainly important for the readers to know the characters and understand who they are and how they got to be who they are and all that sort of stuff, but a lengthy info dump only slows the story down or it brings it to a halt and it makes the readers start reaching for that mental escape key to jump past it. Now, I'm not saying that you can never use an info dump. Sometimes that's the only way to communicate an important part of your backstory. If that's the case, what I suggest you do is keep it short and simple. No big walls of text, a short paragraph, three or four sentences at the most, if even that. Better yet, find a different way to share that information. Now, that's what some video game companies have tried to do with cutscenes. They know that gamers don't like them, so they try to find ways to make them more palatable, more acceptable. We want, find one such attempt in my favorite video game franchise, Mass Effect by BioWare. In the Mass Effect games, players are given a little bit of control over what happens in cutscenes through something called the dialogue wheel. Here, check it out. Repurposed Krogan Hospital. Sturdy, built to withstand punishment. That's unfortunate. Hospitals aren't fun to fight through. What is fun to fight through? Gardens, electronic shops, antique stores, but only if they're classy. Now here's where the cutscene actually starts. And as it goes, if you look down in the bottom center of the screen, you'll see the dialogue wheel. As my teammate scans this corpse that we found in the hospital, uh, I am able to specify how Commander Shepard, my character, answers. I get to set her tone, I get to set what she says, and that gives me a measure of control. That helps determine how the scene plays out and how the overall story unfolds. Enables exploration of treatment modalities. Experimenting on humans? That kind of crap is what makes Cerberus start to seem like a good idea. This brings us to one way in which you can reveal parts of your backstory. Through dialogue. This is a much better choice than the info dump because dialogue can, for the most part, keep the story moving forward. It helps reveal characterization, and usually dialogue isn't just a wall of text that hurts the eyes. Having a character discuss the backstory with another makes it go down a little smoother for the reader. But there are still pitfalls to be found here, the biggest of which is what I like to call the as-you-know problem. It's when two characters wind up having a conversation like this one. So here we are, waiting for the Baron to make his move. I wonder at times why he hates us so much. Well, as you know. The Baron has had strong dislike for people from our planet since lo the local magistrate had his favorite cousin executed for jaywalking. Do you see the problem? If they both know why the Baron hates their planet so much because of executing his cousin for jaywalking, why would they even be talking about that in the first place? If you want to use dialogue to reveal backstory, the best way to do it is using a trick called... Hey, John, what you doing? Oh, hey, Harry. I, I was just telling the participants in the conference about the dumb puppet trick. Well, I've never heard of that. 
What is it? It's something that was created by veteran editor and publisher Jeff Gerke. Oh, yeah? Well, how does it work? Well, you create a character who doesn't know about what that part of the backstory. That way, the main character can fill them in on the details that they don't have. Why would he call it the dumb puppet trick? Uh, well, he goes into that in his book, The Art and Craft of Writing Christian Fiction. Wait a minute. Are you insinuating that I am a dumb puppet? Okay, so my example was a little silly, but you see how the dumb puppet trick works. Like I told the dumb puppet here, you create a character who doesn't know what's going on in the backstory and can stand in for the reader. The dumb puppet can ask questions that the reader would have, and that allows you to answer those questions and communicate important information about the backstory. Now, you have to be careful about how you use this trick. If the only reason that the character is there is to be the dumb puppet, or if the puppet turns out to be too dumb, readers will catch on to what you're doing, and their fingers might start creeping toward that mental escape key, so to speak. But it's still a handy way to slip in backstory. And yet, as great as the dumb puppet trick is, as great as using dialogue is to communicate backstory, it's still not the best way. Now, what I'm about to suggest is going to sound pretty out there, but I think it can work if it's done right. But to understand where I got this idea, we need to talk about a video game franchise called Half-Life and the surprising thing that their developers did. You see, in the original Half-Life game, you play Dr. Gordon Freeman, an MIT-educated research assistant at a top-secret government research lab called Black Mesa, which is located somewhere in the southwestern United States. One day, one of the experiments that Dr. Freeman was working on went haywire and started opening up interdimensional rifts and portals that dumped all sorts of disgusting creatures into the labs, and those creatures start trying to basically kill everybody. So, Gordon is kind of trapped underground with all of his colleagues, but his colleagues want Gordon to travel up to the surface to try to find help. So Gordon sets out fighting his way through all those disgusting creatures until he finally reaches the surface. But once he gets there, he discovers that help has already come in the form of the United States military. The problem is, is that the military has not been sent to help so much as sanitize Black Mesa. And by sanitize, I mean basically kill everything that moves. So now Gordon not only has to defeat the monsters, he has to also survive the military invasion. And he has to go and shut down the experiment so that the creatures stop invading our reality. And after he does that, he goes back through the original portal to stop the invasion from its source. Afterwards, the player is confronted by this guy. Players call him the G-Man. Basically, throughout the entire game, the G-Man is one step ahead of you, almost like he's trying to lead you to the next place where you have to go. And at the end of the game, after you've defeated the final bad guy, he has this to say to you. I have recommended your services to my employers, and they have authorized me to offer you a job. They agree with me that you have limitless potential. You've proved yourself a decisive man, so I don't expect you'll have any trouble deciding what to do. If you're interested, just step into the portal and I will take that as a yes. And that's the end for Gordon Freeman. He's put into suspended animation for some future crisis, whatever it may be. Shortly after the first game came out, it was followed by Half-Life Opposing Force. In that game, the player was a member of the military sent in to sanitize Black Mesa. They have to fight the same monsters that Gordon did, however, the security guards of Black Mesa are also trying to stop you. And at the end of that game, the G-Man puts the player in suspended animation again. After that came Half-Life Blue Shift, in which the player plays Barney a Black Mesa security guard. 
He, too, fights the aliens and the United States military personnel in Black Mesa. And at the end of the game, Barney escapes into the surrounding desert with a group of Gordon's colleagues. Now, the reason why I told you all of that stuff about the first three Half-Life games is to prepare you to watch this clip from the beginning of Half-Life 2. Remember, the previous three games were centered around fighting aliens from another dimension in a government research lab. Now, let's watch the beginning of Half-Life 2. Rise and shine, Mr. Freeman. Rise and shine. Not that I wish to imply you have been sleeping on the job. No one is more deserving of a rest, and all the effort in the world would have gone to waste until... Well, let's just say your hour has come again. The right man in the wrong place can make all the difference in the world. So wake up, Mr. Freeman. Wake up and smell the ashes. City 17. You have chosen, or been chosen, to relocate to one of our finest remaining urban centers. I thought so much of City 17 that I elected to establish my administration here, in the citadel so thoughtfully provided by our benefactors. I've been proud to call City 17 my home. And so, whether you are here to stay or Passing through on your way to parts unknown. Welcome to City 17. Stuff, it's all I have left. It's safer here. All right, I'm moving. Jeez. Were you the only ones on that train? Overwatch stopped our train in the woods and took my husband for questioning. They said he'd be on the next train. I'm not sure when that was. Did they're, they're being nice, though, letting me wait for him. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. welcome, welcome to, to City 17. 17. You have chosen, or been chosen, to relocate to one of our finest remaining urban centers. I thought so Dr. much Breen of City again. 17 that I... I was hoping I'd seen the last of him in City 14. My administration I wouldn't say that too loud. This in is the base Citadel of operations. So provided by our benefactors. I've been proud to call City 17 my home. And so, whether you are here to stay or passing through on your way to parts unknown, welcome to City 17. It's safer here. Can you tell me what's going on here? The first time I played Half-Life 2, I was so confused. Who are the soldiers in the white gas masks? Who are the benefactors that the talking head guy mentions? What is City 17? And why is a Vortigant, one of the aliens from the first three games that tries to kill you, working as a janitor in a train station? Now, unfortunately, none of those questions get answered. Instead, Gordon is found by Barney, the same Barney from Black Mesa, and sent out into a vaguely Eastern European, Eastern European looking city. Eventually, Gordon has to flee from those white gas mask wearing soldiers, where he's found by a young woman named Alex Vance. She brings Gordon to a lab run by one of his former colleagues. 
Now again, when I was first playing Half-Life 2, I figured that this would be the time when they'd finally explain what was going on. But no, the story keeps going. Gordon was sent on his merry way through the canals around City 17 to a safe house of sorts. As a matter of fact, the only hint you get as a player as to what happened between Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2 is this bulletin board you don't find until about an hour into the game. Now that's the crazy thing about Half-Life 2. There's obviously some huge backstory here, and it's never explained. According to the game's developers, this was intentional. The other characters don't know that Gordon has been in suspended animation, and they assume that he knows what's happened. But he doesn't, and neither do the players. But still, the other characters never explain it. Oh, sure, they make passing references to it in dialogue, but nobody ever sits down to fill in the blanks. This actually works. I never found myself really upset and going, what is going on, besides the initial confusion? I never felt gypped by the fact that they didn't sit down and say, well, Gordon, this is what's happened in the past 20 years since you've been missing. Now, I just played it, and I enjoyed what is a really fun gaming franchise. Now, this got me to thinking, maybe this same technique could work in our novels, too. Instead of finding ways to sneak backstory into our novels, why not leave most of it out and let the readers figure it out on their own? Now, that may sound ridiculous, but I've actually seen it work in the book Sushi for One by Cami Tang. The main character in this book is Lex Sakai, a young woman who experienced something rather painful in her past. But rather than tell us what that painful experience is in an info dump, rather than have, say, a flashback to the incident, rather than do the dumb puppet trick, Tang elected to do nothing. We know something's wrong with Lex. The most Tangs gives us is a flash of memory here and there, a sight, a sound, a smell, just a sentence. And the thing is, it's enough that the reader can piece it all together on their own. Tang doesn't confirm the reader's suspicions until page 327. In other words, at the back of of the book when the story is almost done. In other words, just like in Half-Life 2, Cami Tang left out the backstory, and I think her novel was the better for it. It's sort of similar to what I did in my own book, Fail State. I consciously chose not to share Fail State's origin story. I mean, he's a superhero, right? And origin stories are supposed to be part of a superhero story. We see that, for example, in the original Iron Man movie. We see Tony Stark in Afghanistan, and it explains why he needs to build the suit. We see it in Green Lantern, which is a lousy movie, but it's got an origin story in it to explain how Hal Jordan gets the power ring. We see it in Batman Begins, and Batman, and just about any Batman movie you can think of. The idea that Bruce Wayne lost his parents in Crime Alley. It's an expected part of a superhero story, and yet I chose to leave it out. Now, Fail State has an origin story. I know how he got his powers and all that. I've got it all up here. But I realized that that bit of backstory wasn't necessary to the story that I was trying to tell. So I left it out entirely. Not even a mention. And you know what? I've only been asked once about it by a reader. Only once. Now, the Half-Life 2 technique, if we can call it that, works like this. Come up with backstory, reams of it if you want, but then only put in the bare minimum of what you absolutely need in your novel. And then don't do it with info dumps or flashbacks or even the dumb puppet trick. Instead, just little flashes of information, little bits of conversation, little thoughts that pop into your character's mind. Show the backstory and how it shaped your character and the world around them. Let the readers fill in the blanks themselves. And this will help keep your story flowing and not let it get bogged down or stopped. 
Now, obviously you can't always do this. Like I said earlier, there are times when telling works best. There will be times when the dumb puppet trick is the best way to go to get some backstory woven into your novel. What you're trying to do is keep your reader from treating your work like a cutscene. Keep their finger off that mental escape key. Now, you're not done with me yet, though. I've got an assignment for you if you want to try it. I've come up with three different backstory scenarios, and my challenge for you is to try to find a way to weave that backstory information into a short scene. And don't use info dumps unless you absolutely have to. Here, are the, here they are. Scenario number one, your point of view character has been accepted into a special honors program. What no one knows is that they cheated to get in. Scenario number two, your point of view character has fallen in love for the first time, but his or her family was once cursed by a sorcerer. The first love of every family member is destined to die. Scenario number three. Your point of view character meets someone who thinks they're meeting for the first time, but they have met before, and as far as your character was concerned, it was a painful experience. So, go ahead, put on your thinking caps, and see what you can come up with. If you want, go ahead and share them in the comments below. Thanks for joining me, and God bless you in your writing endeavors.